All right. Hi there. This is Ann Mills once more presenting about GYN pathology. And this afternoon, I'll be talking to you about zebras in the uterus. So interesting and emerging uterine mesenchymal entities. So when we talk about uterine mesenchymal tumors, of course, the horses are the smooth muscle tumors. That's the most common thing. We see it all the time. We will not be talking about the horses today. We will instead be focusing on the zebras. And the zebras range from endometrial stromal sarcomas, which are some of the more common zebras, particularly the low-grade type, less common is the high-grade variant, to some fun entities such as pecomas, including malignant pecomas, which now that I know how to recognize, I'm seeing more and more. The same is true for inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors. They've historically been quite under-recognized in the uterus and can occasionally have malignant behavior. A newly defined entity, the NTRAC rearranged uterine sarcomas, which are targetable with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And then another newly recognized entity, SMARK-A4 deficient uterine sarcoma. And once we've peeled away all these groups, we then have a much smaller wastebasket of undifferentiated uterine sarcoma. We'll touch only in mention on the big mimickers of these mesenchymal tumors, carcinosarcoma and dedifferentiated carcinoma. We'll begin with low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma, which I'll go through fairly quickly because I think most of you are familiar. It's the second most common type of uterine sarcoma, and it occurs in pre- and perimenopausal women, often with bleeding and pain. They can be quite large, more than 15 centimeters, in fact, even though that's listed as sort of the upper limit here. And they often involve blood vessels. Often there's both a gross and a radiographic uh, presentation of these tumors really stuffing the large blood vessels. Morphologically, they can be variable, but the prototypic, prototypic appearance really looks like normal proliferative endometrial stroma. You have these relatively monotonous looking ovoid to spindled cells with variable amounts of pale cytoplasm. And note that the cytoplasm can certainly be influenced by the hormonal milieu. These can get decidualized just like normal endometrial stroma. There's really no significant cytologic atypia Although mitoses can certainly be present, they should not exceed around 10 to 10 high power fields. Once more, lymphovascular invasion is quite common. These things can grow in solid sheets and nests or in fascicular patterns, and the growth definitionally ought to be infiltrative. They have this sort of tongue-like growth pattern. And indeed, if you have anything less than a couple millimeters of tongue-like growth, you can consider the possibility that this is an endometrial stromal nodule, but that really is quite rare compared to low-grade ESS and ought to have, again, no more than a few millimeters of tongue-like infiltration. I have nothing to disclose. I hope by the time I retire, I will have something to disclose, but it hasn't happened yet. So what I'd like to do um, in the next hour is to talk about endometrial hyperplasia and metaplasia. And I'd like to start with a case um, that we'll go through and then we'll refer back to um, as we uh, march our way through the talk. And the case is that of a 33-year-old lady. She presented with abnormal uterine bleeding. She had a history of infertility and previously removed polyps. And so this was her sampling. And I think you can appreciate on low power magnification, there are multiple fragments of tissue. They're actually quite busy. Um, there's a number of glands um, that are populating these endometrial tissue fragments. At higher power, you can see it's rather crowded gland population um, with uh, some intervening stroma. Um, here's another area where you can see there's a slight difference in the appearance of the glands in one area versus another. And here's the cytomorphology of the epithelium, which was pretty uniform throughout. But there were other areas of endometrium that had slightly less crowded endometrial glands, as you can see here. I like this case because it brings up a number of diagnostic considerations when you're looking at an endometrial sampling. In this situation, I think you could consider the possibility that this represents a secretory or hypersecretory. Uh, endometrium. Maybe you're considering the possibility that, you know, she has a history of polyps. Do these represent polyps that have an increased number of glands, hence an endometrial hyperplasia? Or is this a precursor lesion? Is this a, a, an endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia or EIN, atypical hyperplasia used interchangeably that happens to show secretory type change? 
So again, what I'd like to do in the next hour is really talk about diagnostic issues related to the recognition of endometrial hyperplasias and metaplasias and really go over and give you a practical approach to when you should be concerned um, about the types of changes you're seeing. Um, how do you distinguish benign mimics of neoplasia, so-called benign hyperplasias and metaplasias from neoplasias, which can show uh, different differentiation states and give you a practical approach um, to the diagnosis. So um, for many years, endometrial uh, precursor lesions were um, classified into four different groups based on its morphologic appearance. And so the WHO in 1994 and 2003 separated out um, lesions of the endometrium based on whether or not they had a complex or simple architecture and whether or not there was atypia. And there had been a lot of issues with regard to um, the practicality of this classification scheme, particularly with regard to what represents atypia. And that represented the most difficult thing to reproduce diagnostically, even among expert GYN pathologists. So today, this morning, we're going to talk about some big topics in GYN pathology, stuff that you'll see commonly, and then some stuff that you won't see as commonly. All right, so we're going to start today with serous neoplasia of the fallopian tube and ovary. And we've got four major topics today. We're going to talk about high-grade serous, low-grade serous carcinoma, and then their precursor lesions. So serous tubal intraepithelial neoplasia and serous borderline neoplasia. Normally, I would talk about the precursor and then the cancer, but we're going to do it this way because it sort of helps you then as you get to looking at the precursor lesions, if you've already got all of the uh, morphologic evidence for how to do the carcinoma diagnoses. So as you guys know, epithelial ovarian carcinoma constitutes most ovarian malignancies, has a very high mortality rate, and is the most deadly of all of the gynecologic cancers. We have five subtypes. They have different molecular, morphologic, and clinical features. And here they are. Okay, we've got serous carcinoma, of which we have both high grade and low grade. That's what we'll focus on today. Then there's also endometrioid carcinoma, clear cell carcinoma, and mucinous carcinoma of the ovary. We're not gonna talk about those today, but I put them up here for, uh, for completeness. All right, so let's start and get involved with our serous carcinoma. When you're looking at high-grade serous carcinoma, this is by far and away the most common epithelial ovarian carcinoma. So if you're dealing with an ovarian carcinoma, this should be at the, the forefront of your differential. It's also the most deadly. We see it in older women, and unfortunately, because of the ovary being free in the peritoneum, it usually presents at a high stage with 70% of them greater than figo 2 a Then we have low-grade serous carcinoma, which can be a bit tricky. Okay, it's much less common um, variant of epithelial ovarian carcinoma, constituting about 5 to 10% of all of the cancers. We see it in slightly younger women, although that doesn't really help you in the differential. Um, it often also presents at a high stage, but can present at low stage. And, um, these, the, both of these are going to be treated with surgical debulking, and then whether or not to get chemotherapy, we'll talk about here in a little bit. Okay, this is probably the most important point of this entire talk, is that low and high-grade serous carcinoma are not a continuum of the same disease. They're two entirely separate, different types of carcinoma. They have uh, very different prognoses. It's important to find the differences between them even though sometimes at some institutions they are treated similarly. And we'll go into where they are treated the same and where they, um, in areas where they aren't treated the same. 